Our gospel reading this morning is from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. That is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Who wants to pray for the preacher this morning? Or who's willing to pray for the preacher this morning? Thank you, Toby or Teresa. Did you raise your hand? You she said you can. Now you're pointing at each other. Teresa, are you willing to pray for me? Thank you, dear. I know you're always willing. Teresa, another proud member of the class of 1976 Delaney High School. Yay! like to pray for Pastor Terry. We like to pray that she will be healed of her ailments and the doctors will find out what's going on. We pray that while she is retired, she will have um, healing and emotionally, physically, and spiritually, and to know that we are thinking of you and praying for you and that um, we're thankful that you're here to preach at our congregation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, I said you have to answer what the kids did. Let me see your joy face again. That's pretty good. Leslie's got the best one. She's joyous back there. Yay, she's got the hands and everything. When's the last time you experienced true joy? Yes, Mark. Aw, 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 that's why I like him best. Just kidding, just kidding. When I came back, that was joyful for me too. Who else has a joy? I always say who has a joy when we pray about joys, but when's the last time you experienced pure joy? Nobody here. Dong, dong, dong. Yes, Jamaica. You're moving. Yes. That's joy and terror and disbelief all at once, right? Yes. Amen. Do I see another hand out there? Yes, Kathy. Amen. Every time you pick up your 14 year old granddaughter from school and she gets in the car, it's joy. Gail McGuckin, you had joy when you, the day you stood up and said that you were going to be a grandmother. Now, that's only beaten by the day the grandchild arrives and you hold that baby for the first time. I tell you, people who never make a sound in church will come in, they'll get the air horn, they'll stand on the pew. I got news, people. I got a grandchild. It's a beautiful baby. I thought my kid was something, but it's nothing compared to this. This is, this is really a good kid, right? Okay, when's the last time you experienced terror? When what? Tornado coming. Tornado coming. <laughs> How many of you get a 
message in your phone that there's a tornado coming. And how many of you get scared when you hear that? Some of you are just sitting there like, eh, tornado, big deal. Look what happened to Dorothy and Toto people. Uh, who rang that bell? She can tell you what happens when there's a tornado. Okay, nobody else had any terror? Yes. Oh my goodness, Mary Ann. You can hear it, her computer and her bank accounts were hacked this week. Did they straighten it out for you yet? Tomorrow. She'll know tomorrow, gosh. We gotta pray about that one today. Janet. Israel being attacked again? Yes. October 7th, that one? Yeah. Okay, it's terrorizing, so I'm going to turn on the news and see what's happening in the world, isn't it? Um, anybody else have a moment of terror? I had one this morning coming to church. I was late already because my dog, who is 13 years old, has a little dementia, went outside, would not come in the house. I ended up tossing hot dog buns out the door to try to lead her in. So I don't know why I'm going to leave my hot dogs on, but you know, she had some buns and finally made it inside. I get in the car, I'm getting on 795, and somebody decided I wasn't going fast enough for them. I was doing only eight miles over the speed limit. Passed me, cut me off, I had to go off the road. That's terror. But I'm here, thank God, I'm here. How about disbelief? When's the last time you experienced disbelief? Oh, that's a quick one there, Toby. Louise. Watching the key bridge fall. Watching the key bridge fall. I, absolutely, that's what I thought of. When you saw the key bridge fall, how many of you thought that cannot, it's just, it's just like a toy, just collapsed. In a matter of seconds, the bridge was in the water. Anything else? Any other moments of disbelief? How many of you have ever sat in a sermon and said, did she just say that out loud? There was one of those moments. My neighbor Kelly says he's going to write a book about me called, Did She Say That? Yes, she did. <laughs> Any other disbelief out there? When your loved one passes and you just can't believe it. The day my husband's life support was disconnected, they told me he had five minutes, he lived three days. But I said to him as they disconnected his life support, I'm ready for this, I'm not ready for this, I'm not ready for this. And I had been knowing for eight years he told me he had eight years, and for 10 years, I knew he was going to die. And that day, I went home and turned my key, and he was on the floor. I thought, this cannot be happening. This can't be happening. Well, the disciples experienced all these things in one little section. While they were still talking about this, what is this that they're talking about? Anybody know what happens in Luke before this? This is the end of the story of the road to Emmaus. You remember that story? We don't read the same lessons every year. But we pick this one up sort of at the end of that encounter. He's walking on the road. They're leaving Jerusalem. Cleopas and another unnamed follower of Jesus. They meet a stranger and he says, what's going on? And they said, are you the only person in Jerusalem who has no idea what's happening? He says, tell me. He said, we were there for Jesus of Nazareth. We had hoped he was the one. But they crucified him and buried him. And now some of his disciples say he was raised from the dead. And Jesus says, well, let's talk about scripture. And they walk along. And they get to a place where these two are spending the night. They've walked a long way. And they compel him to stay because they can't let him go. There's something about this stranger. And how do they know him? In the breaking of what? The bread. When they sit down, they eat with him. He's made known to them. They get up and they run back to Jerusalem. And that's where we pick up the story. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Now in this, in Luke's gospel, when Jesus is talking peace, as I said last week, he's talking about salvation be with you. It's more than just shalom, the Old Testament concept of the absence of warfare. That's what we think peace is. It's more than that. It's more about wholeness and completeness, everything being made right. Now it's also includes salvation. Salvation be with you, he says. They're terrified because they think they're seeing what? A ghost. They've seen Jesus raise somebody else from the dead. They call Lazarus from his tomb. They've seen him walk on water, heal the sick. They've seen him feed thousands of people with the one kid's lunch. 
You know, if they're scared because they think it's a ghost. Okay, here's the big question. How many of you think that you've ever seen a ghost? How many of you have a ghost encounter to share? You're afraid to say that here, right? People think you're nuts. Yes, Mackenzie. Okay, so you saw a white figure walk in front of you, and it was not a real person, right? Okay, anybody else have a ghost story to tell? I had a parsonage once that people would not come to Bible study in because they were sure it was haunted. I wasn't too unsure myself at that moment. But Jesus talks about ghosts all the time, right? He's walking on the water toward the disciples in the storm, and they say, ah, it's a ghost. So apparently they believed in ghosts, and he said, I'm not a ghost. And say there are no such thing as ghosts. He said, I'm not a ghost, so maybe there are ghosts. I don't know. They think he's a ghost. So what does he do to prove he's not a ghost? He says, touch me again. Does the ghost have flesh and blood? Can a ghost eat? Because he asks for something, he's hungry, and they give him fish, and he eats it, and they're like, wow, it must be him. So it says, while they were in their joy, they were still disbelieving. In their joy, they were still disbelieving. It's like, it's Jesus, but how can it be Jesus? How can this be happening? Well, how do we understand all these things, that they have joy, they have terror, they have disbelief, they have wondering? I think it all can be summed up in the word awe, right? Not like awe, you're so cute, but awe, wow. Awe. How can this be that our Savior who was killed is back in our midst? And it's got to be scary, isn't it? If any of you saw someone that you loved who left you, who died, and they walked in and sat down, you'd be scared too, wouldn't you? You'd be disbelieving too? Because we're so used to hearing about the resurrection that we forget what it was like for them. It was the first person to ever return from death. Now he had some people that he brought back, like Lazarus. He resuscitated Lazarus. Lazarus is not still walking around somewhere. He'd be all over the cover of the National Enquirer. Lazarus, 2,000 years old, still walking around. But he lived his life and he died and he was buried again at some point. But Jesus is not in a grave. He is still with us every moment of every day. So if we're going to think about awe, I think we need to look at the passage from James to really understand what it means for us today. The first line of James says it. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Amen? Let me read that one to you again, and let me hear an amen after that one. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Amen. amen. You are a child of God. Some of us don't remember what it is to be somebody's child, right? It's been so long since our parents have been gone. Not so long for me, less than a year for my mom. I miss her every day. But some of you lost your parents years and years and years ago. But do you remember what it was like to be loved, to be cuddled, to be held and told that you were the most important person in their lives? No, nope. some of you don't have that experience because some of you had parents who didn't quite do that. But you've had someone love you unconditionally, right? Someone has loved you unconditionally? Trust me, your pastors love you unconditionally. They do. Don't always like you, don't always like your behavior, but we love you unconditionally. Because Jesus gave us that role to fulfill in other people's lives. But if you ever had a dog, you've been loved unconditionally. I thank God every day for my crazy big black dog because she, I say, thank you God for Jesse, my crazy big black dog who shows me unconditional love. So no matter what happens with the dog, they'll forgive you. Cats, not so much, but dogs always forgive, right? I was so glad to see Kaylee this morning. First time I've seen her since I've been back. She ran and gave me a hug and said, what was your joy seeing her dog as she'd been away, greeting Cooper and Cooper greeting her. Did you have this da 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 as you ran toward each other moment? <laughs> to be loved unconditionally is to be loved in spite of everything you've done wrong, in spite of every mistake you've ever made, in spite of every time you just hit the wall or stepped in it, as they say. That is what it is to be loved unconditionally. That is what it is to be a child of God. We are children of God, and that is who we are. Amen. But the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. We will be has not yet been revealed. 
I say that every time I conduct a funeral, that's part of our liturgy. You don't know what we shall be, but when we see him, we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. What a reason to rejoice, right? We are children of God. There's a little terror in there, too, because what comes next? But everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Raise your hand if you've sinned today. Some of you have to think. Some of you have been up long enough to have sinned. Give me time. Because when that guy cut me off in 795, I didn't, my first words were not, bless you. <laughs> they were not. But I did get to the point where I caught up to him on the highway and I said, God bless you as I passed him again. I didn't say, God bless you. I said, bless you. Bless you with safety and security and all those other things. So we got to do that, don't we? To get over what we initially think. But some of you haven't sinned yet today. I'm surprised. I know y'all. You're sinners. You're people. That's why I know you sin, because we all fall short of the glory of God, right? Other than Mark over here, who is my favorite. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But we've got to look at God in the world and see him here. Because Christ is still with us in each other. Christ is still with us. I said last week, look in the mirror and see Christ's reflection back at you. Look at your neighbor and see Christ. Look at the people around you right now. I'm, that's not a, I want you to really look at the people around you right now. Make eye contact with somebody. And say, I see Christ in you. <laughs> say it out loud. I see Christ in you. I see Christ in you. I see Christ in each of you here today because Christ lives in you. He lives in us. We've got to let that joy out because sometimes I'll say, who has that joy today? And you look at me like, I don't have joy. My life stinks. Sometimes life feels like it's overwhelming, doesn't it? That's when you got to share your joy with somebody else so that somebody else knows joy. Because the world knows disbelief. There are so many people who have never been in a building that looks like this. It used to be that people came to churches for weddings. Now in Maryland, especially anybody can do your wedding. You just have to sign up and do it. West Virginia, you have to be registered at least with the state um, to do a wedding. You have to have some proof that you have some connection to somebody, but you can get that. You go online. I had a caterer once at a wedding say to me, Lady, I'm ready. If you, if you have a problem, I can step in for you. I said, Excuse me? The caterer said that to me. He said, Yeah. He said, I'm ordained like you. I said, you are, huh? I said, where's your ordination? He said, at um, ICanDoWeddings.com. I said, you're not ordained like me, baby. I said, did you do 90 hours in a theological school past your bachelor's degree? He said, um, no. I said, then you're not ordained like I am. But people don't go to church anymore for anything. So you got to take the church into the world, right? you got to take God with you when you leave here. Don't just say Jesus was in the building and now I'm gone and he's not here. Because we've got to take Christ into our daily living. We've got to see Christ in our daily living. We've got to experience the awe and the joy and sometimes disbelief because sometimes we doubt, don't we? So, they open their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead, and on the third day, repentance of forgiveness of sins, we proclaim his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. That's what our job is. We're witnesses of Christ. We're a witness to the power of Christ. So when's the last time you saw Jesus in the world? That's my last question today. When's the last time you saw Jesus? You just saw Jesus when you turned around and saw her. Yeah, you said that to each other. When's the last time you saw Christ acting in the world? Oh, we've got to look for him because he's there. You've got to look for him in your actions. The last time someone forgave someone else, that's when you saw Christ. The last time somebody gave you a hug when you needed one, you showed Christ to that person. The last time somebody hugged you when you needed a hug, that is Christ Jesus. It doesn't have to be the big ticket item. It's not like Cecil B. DeMille splitting the Red Sea in the movie. You know, they did that with Jell-O, right? It's a weird thing. They did that with Jell-O. I have all sorts of trivia in my brain. 
Sometimes it comes out. But what you got to do is you got to notice when you see something and say something. You got to see Jesus in the world and you got to be Jesus in the world. You got to take him into the world because the world is disbelieving until they see the truth in you. So show them Christ. Um, now, when you're driving, it's hard sometimes, isn't it, to bless somebody? I gotta tell you a story. This happened to me when I was in seminary. I'd been ordained, and I had a collar on because I'd been to the hospital to see somebody, and in 1985, nobody believed you were a pastor when you were a 20-something-year-old little girl. And I was at a traffic circle in D.C., and this guy came up and thought I'd cut him off. I didn't cut him off. He wanted to be in front of me, and he couldn't get in front of me. So he lays on his horn next to me, he's giving me the finger, and I just turned my head, and my hair was long, and he saw the collar, and he went under the seat. <laughs> I just looked at him, until he finally looked up, and I gave him a little blessing and drove on. That man, I don't think, ever, ever gave anybody the finger again. We've got to have moments like that of joy and laughter and surprise and wonder and awe. So I want you this week to go home and look for the joy in your life. Look for Christ and be Christ for someone else because the world is disbelieving until you show them Christ. They're going to continue to disbelieve that anybody could love them, that anybody could forgive them, that anyone could give their lives for their sake. We know that. So let me say again, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.